So did you um, have your coffee today? Because you're going to need it today. I'm Reverend Nicole Riley. I'm the lead and teaching pastor here. So welcome in person and welcome online. Today we are going to be talking more about the United Methodist Church. And we have a lot of things to talk about today. So coffee was really good. If you brought a little snack, that might have also been a little helpful today. Um, so last week, when we began, we talked about how uh, we as United Methodists have the sense of what God is like and how we're called to live our lives. And this word is grace. Uh, it is a word that means that you and I are loved and accepted by God, and that we are then called out of that love and acceptance to love and accept others, to welcome others to the table of grace. Uh, grace is a familiar word to a lot of people, but when we talk about it in the church, we have a particular way of talking about it. First, uh, grace is the undeserved unmerited, loving action of God toward people. This is about God's welcome for us. And then second, grace is the actual power, helper, energy of God. And one of the manifestations of this is that then we are called to love and welcome others, to care for others. Uh, Jeff and I went to lunch last week after church and went over to Wood Ranch. Do you like Wood Ranch? Yeah, Wood Ranch. Went to Wood Ranch for some lunch, and uh, I always grill Jeff on how things went in worship. And I said, so, you know, what did you think about the sermon today? And he said, uh, well, I knew the thing about how grace is God's unconditional love and acceptance. But I didn't really remember the thing that then that means we have to be loving and gracious to everybody around us. And I thought, yeah. That is so true. We are usually more wired to receive and don't really get that then we're called also to give. So today, we're going to continue our series. We're going to do a part two of our series on the Methodist Church, and we're going to talk about grace a little bit, but we're going to look at history, and we're going to talk about one of my favorite concepts in the Methodist Church called the quadrilateral. And then we're going to end by talking about how we're called to love and care for one another. So we're going to start with a little history. Now, when I say a little history, you may not think it sounds like a little bit. Okay. Originally, I thought that I would go get my PhD and teach church history. So I like church history a lot. So I had to really constrain myself so that it's not too much church history. But I think it will give us a context. And so what we're going to start with when we talk about church history is right at the beginning. We're going to talk about the book of Acts. This is the start of the Christian church. And in our text today, Peter, who's one of Jesus' followers, leader in Christianity, is telling people what their response needs to be to Jesus. So this is Acts chapter 2, verses 38 through 47. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together 
and had all things in common, they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this gives us a window into the early church. It shows us right at the beginning what the church was like. But how did we get from there to here? It's quite a journey. So let's spend some time on Christian history. So after Christ's death and resurrection, the next 1,700 years of faith history took place first with the Catholic Church, and then eventually for us as United Methodists, the Anglican Church. So you see our Jewish heritage is, of course, the bulk, Christ's birth, and then the Catholic Church is the first church. Then we as United Methodists claim our Anglican heritage, and then today our United Methodist heritage. So early on, the church was persecuted, but by 312, the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, and Theodosius I would make Christianity the official religion of the empire by 380. Now, there were differences in language, culture, and doctrine, and this split the church in 1054 into the Roman Catholic Church in the West and the Orthodox Church in the East. And because the church is made up of imperfect people, the church developed some imperfect practices. And in 1517, a monk named Martin Luther posted 95 points on the church door, calling for reforms in the Catholic church, and the church split once again. Those who protested the ways of the Catholic church were called Protestants. And some Protestants followed Luther and became Lutherans. Other followed a reformer named John Calvin and became Calvinists, who are the ancestors of today's Presbyterians. England's King Henry VIII was a Catholic until the Pope wouldn't let him get a divorce. So Henry started the Church of England. He got divorced several times. He kicked the Catholic Church out of England and took the church's land and money. The Church of England, also known as the Anglican or the Episcopal Church, became an important Christian denomination. Meanwhile, the Roman Catholic Church cleaned up its act, but the hard feelings of the Reformation remained. Because the church is made up of imperfect people, the church once again needed reform, and an Anglican preacher, Church of England preacher, John Wesley, set out a different path, and the Methodist movement began. So you have the Anglican church. Out of that came the Methodist movement in England, which came then to the United States, and then the church, the Methodist Episcopal Church in 1784. Wesley preached and lived a message of God's grace and holy living that spoke to the common people who were often not welcome in the Church of England. His dedication and methods ignited and fanned the flames of Methodism. So that gives you a little thumbnail sketch of how we got from Acts to how we got to having all these churches, including the United Methodist Church. I think it's good to have a little bit of a context so that we have a sense of how all these different denominations kind of come together and why they broke apart. I want to share with you one of the things that I think is so important and so helpful when we talk about the United Methodist Church. So let me teach you um, one of my favorite concepts. When I became a United Methodist when I was in college, this was one of the things that particularly drew me in, and it is called the quadrilateral. What the quadrilateral is, is it's a tool. It's a tool to help us make decisions in our lives. 
You see, John Wesley, when he started out the Methodist movement, he had kind of a discernible pattern. And when you looked at his life, you could see how he made decisions was pretty much the same each time. And what we found was, as we looked at his writings and reflected on Wesley's life, that he used scripture, tradition, experience, and reason. And these four things in dialogue with one another helped him understand God's leading in his life. And it also helps us today understand God's leading. Now, in Wesley's understanding of the quadrilateral, not all four were equal. Rather, Wesley and the church's view was that scripture is primary. So if we were to illustrate it, it would look like this. Scripture, the biggest circle, then reason, tradition, and experience together. So let's do a a quick look at how this all works and what this means. So scripture, which is the biggest piece, is the foundation of our faith. It's where things begin and things end. It's where we get the knowledge of who God is and Jesus Christ and his life among us. Scripture for Wesley and understanding his own life was primary, and it's primary for us at the church as well. Then tradition. Tradition means the tradition of the um, larger Christian church, but also the tradition in the Methodist church as well. Now, we know that there is wisdom in our traditions, and so we try to glean that wisdom so that we might live more fully today. Experience is that Wesley understood that faith needed to be more than something we believed in our head. It had to be something that touched our heart and that we lived it out in our lives. So experience was all about taking head and heart and bringing them together. Experience is one way that we learn God, experience God, and then share God in the world. And then last, reason. Reason can, and it does, help us be disciples. We know that reason does have limits, of course. Um, The postmodern world certainly shows us some of that, but Reason allows us to study, it allows us to grow and to gain knowledge and to reflect on that knowledge. So, all of those together scripture, reason, tradition, and experience. These things help us when we are making decisions, when we are looking at how we are going to live our lives. We look at them through this lens. Now, in addition, for this helping us, for how we live our lives, this tool has also been an important tool as we study the Bible as well. The Bible needs us not only to come to it with what we read in Scripture, but of course we come with our traditions, we come with our reason, we come with our experience. There's actually nobody who comes to the Bible purely objective and agenda-free. We all have our interpretations of Scripture. One writer puts it this way. He says, The idea that everyone else approaches the Bible with baggage and agenda and lenses, and I don't, is the ultimate in arrogance. We all will read into Scripture from our own perspective and culture, and what the quadrilateral helps us do is to become aware of that, to embrace that that's a reality, and then to use those tools to help us understand Scripture for our own lives and our own time. Okay, one last piece that I want to talk about. Last week, we talked about grace, and we talked about how grace has these two parts, this method by which we become more filled with God's grace. The word Methodist comes from the idea that we have a method of spiritual growth. So what is this method? Well, we talked about it being two things, works of piety, which is works of devotion toward God, and then works of mercy. So works of piety look like this, prayer, scripture study, communion, fasting, Christian community, and healthy living. 
These are the things that we do that draw us closer to God's grace so that we might receive it more fully in our lives. And then the second part of this is kind of that outflow piece, works of mercy. This is when we are doing good, we are visiting the sick and those in prison, we are feeding and clothing people, we are using money wisely. And because Wesley, in his time, it was about an opposition to slavery. So both of these are part of our tradition. They are a method for growing in grace, both devotion to God and then caring for the world, acts of mercy that spring out of our faith. I want to focus more on these works of mercy today. So let's look a bit closer at these works of mercy. John Wesley made serving the poor and the hungry and the oppressed a central part of his Methodist movement. He said, Christianity is essentially a social religion, and to turn it into a solitary religion is to destroy it. Wesley fought for better treatment for prisoners in England's jails, opposed the sale of alcoholic beverages. We had talked before about how in Wesley's time, there was a big problem with gin carts where they would wait for people outside of their jobs and then they would spend all their money on alcohol. And so he opposed that, felt that war might sometime be justified, but wasn't convinced that violence ever solved problems and was passionate about ending slavery. Here's actually a photograph of a letter he wrote condemning slavery. So Methodists have always organized to deal with social justice issues. So you will see Methodists involved in all kinds of things because we don't all agree the same, right? So you might go to something and you might see Methodists on this side and Methodists on the other side. We are the kind of people who want to get involved and want to make the world a better place. And in fact, we have a book that we use as Methodists called the Book of Discipline. It's a terrible name, I know. Um, but the Book of Discipline is basically our playbook of how the United Methodist Church officially thinks on things. So if you had a Book of Discipline, you'd, you'd see organizational stuff, how the church is organized or what it means to be a member, things like that. But you would also see a part of it that's called the social principles of the United Methodist Church. And in that section, you would see how United Methodists officially think about the natural world, the nurturing community, the social community, the economic community, the political community, and the world community. So if you were to read those, if you were to take a book of discipline or Google that and go online, you might read some things that you would think, I agree with that. And you might read some other things. You might think, I don't really agree with that. That's normal. All of us are going to look at these things, and some we're going to agree with, and some we're not going to agree with. Um, we are not a you-must-agree-with-this kind of a church. We use these tools as a way to get us to think. I find that when I look at the social principles, what I find are thoughtful people trying to make sense of the world in the context of their faith. And I think they're worth exploring. So what I want to do is I want us to end this part with us actually doing the creed. So there is actually a social principles creed. It's a little long because it covers all those things, but I want us to join together in saying it, and this will expose you a bit to what the social principles of the church look like if you're not as familiar with them. So join with me. We believe in God, creator of the world, and in Jesus Christ, the redeemer of creation. We believe in the Holy Spirit, through whom we acknowledge God's gifts, and we repent of our sin in misusing these gifts to idolatrous ends. We affirm the natural world as God's handiwork, and dedicate ourselves to its preservation, enhancement, and faithful use by humankind. We joyfully receive for ourselves and others the blessings of community, 
sexuality, marriage, and the family. We commit ourselves to the rights of men, women, children, youth, young adults, the aging, and people with disabilities to improvement of the quality of life and to the rights and dignity of racial, ethnic, and religious minorities. We believe in the right and duty of persons to work for the glory of God and the good of themselves and others, and in the protection of their welfare in doing so, in the rights of property as a trust from God, collective bargaining, and responsible consumption, and in the elimination of economic and social distress. We dedicate ourselves to peace throughout the world, to the rule of justice and law among nations, and to individual freedom for all people of the world. We believe in the present and final triumph of God's word in human affairs and gladly accept our commission to manifest the life of the gospel in the world. Amen. So I hope over these couple weeks as we have looked at the Methodist Church that you have heard that this is a, a church that has some powerful tools, tools for growing in grace, tools for serving others, uh, tools that enable us to live our lives more fully because we are a church of grace and we are a church of faith and action. Let us pray.